Well, we're already up to 35. So they can hear us now. Yes, they can. People are already asking questions. We're gonna wait a few minutes for everybody to get here. So uh, one of the questions that came in is, how do you create a plot on one computer and use it on a different one? Uh, we'll somewhat go through that when I do an install and play around with it a little bit. But basically, um, you can generate keys on one machine and then generate plots on one machine. And you just need to be cognizant of taking the same keys.yaml file and the entry or the entire plots.yaml file over to the new machine with the plot. The plots are totally cross-platform. They're just data files. Like Think of them like uh, an ISO image or something like that. You also need to make sure you use the same keys, right, Gene? Yes. Yeah. You better use the same keys on both machines. So, like, um, I have a farmer uh, out in EC2, and then I have those keys also here on my MacBook, and I'll be showing you the results of that because I was the original kind of farmer that wants this chain. So uh, we'll be answering questions both in Zoom and on Keybase. Let's see. Hey, Matt, can you answer Michael's question? Michael's question, pardon me. Where am I? Is this, oh, Q&A. Ah, right. there it is. There you go. There's Q&A and there's chat. So there's two things to the Zoom. Uh, and I, I was checking Keybase. Uh, Oh, so um, the offers, they don't get sent to the, to the network. They are entirely communicated with whatever you do with the .offer file. When you respond to an offer, that gets pushed as a transaction. But the offers themselves, they're, they're just uh, text files, basically. Yeah, we should uh, reread the questions, too. Yep. Oh, sorry. The question was uh, on partial transactions that are introduced in the Colored Coins blog post, which are called offers. Um, are they propagated in the network via the P2P network or some other mechanism? And as, as uh, Matt was saying, it's uh, whatever way you can propagate it, but it's not necessarily part of the chain. Uh, Taylor asked, uh, do you have any recommendations for building a system for farming? Um, there's actually two systems that you want. Uh, you want a farmer harvester, and it, does, it needs to be very different than the machine you have for plotting. Um, for plotting, what I'd recommend if you're going to build new hardware from scratch is to uh, buy a machine that has uh, NVMe 2 SSD drives in it. Um, there's some links in the FAQ and other places that kind of explain what I mean by those drives. They get about three gigabytes per second write speed, 
And you'll find that write speed ends up being the number one limiter to how fast you can plot. And what you do is you'd, uh, well, I helped a friend of mine uh, build one recently. Uh, the board had two NVMe two, um, slots was the word I was searching for, uh, that will let you actually then have, say, two to four terabytes of NVMe2. And that machine looks a little bit like a gaming rig, you know, just a modern CPU, but not super fast. Um, a decent amount of RAM, but I mean, again, like 16 gig, we're not talking about anything special. Uh, you know, video card doesn't count, but maybe you want to be able to farm, uh, game with it as well. Uh, that machine is the one that you want to use and have those NVMe2 drives be your temporary working directory. And once you plot a file, then you want to copy it off to something slow and spinny. Um, you know, one of the great things to do is to have a USB 3 uh, RAID in you know, a bunch of disks mode and stick it on a Raspberry Pi. Um, the Raspberry Pi is more than capable of farming and harvesting and running full node, uh, but it's not capable of being a time lord or plotting. So, you know, a gamer rig to plot and then whatever you have that's slow and cheap uh, to farm. Um, on plotting right now, uh, Ubuntu, Debian, and macOS are the fastest plotters out there. Um, we expect to change that over time, but you know that is the current state of the art. Um, I will say that I think it's easier to maintain a, a plotting rig and a, a farmer uh, in uh, Debian. Uh, Debian desktop works, so you get the full kind of UI look if you want it. So anyway, that's kind of the right answer for you know I want to build a rig. It's basically build a plotting rig and then find the cheapest storage and the cheapest farmer that you can get out there. Hey, Gene, I just wanted to add that we, uh, we keep um, timings for a bunch of different uh, rigs, and the specifications are specified on the wiki. So if you go to the Chia blockchain uh, Git repo and go to the wiki and look at the K values, you'll see timings for various uh, different um, uh, rigs that people have built. And so you can get an idea there about the speeds. OK. Well, let's see. Uh, I think what we'll do first is we'll go ahead and install the new uh, Windows native code. Um, that means that I need to do one thing, which is uh, create a VirtualBox clone and share that. So let me do that while I will take more questions while I do that. Do you know how much storage is out there right now? Uh, I can look in just one second. Okay, sorry. Anybody who's got it installed can do Chia space net space and it'll show you a two hour estimate of the current storage. Yeah, uh, I was just going to uh, answer the current question about uh, the current complexity for farming and what's the chance of uh, earning reward. Uh, so your chance is uh, proportional to how much space you have versus uh, the space that's currently on the system. So if you do that command that uh, Gene just sent out, um, that'll tell you how much space has estimated to be on the system uh, based on how hard it is to uh, earn a reward. And um, yeah, given the amount of space that you have over the amount of total amount of space, that's your chance of winning a, winning a block. And right now that number is about 92 terabytes. Yeah, so you can do the calculations there for, for the odds. Um, for those who are curious about the space calculation, um, you'll know it's mostly accurate when the iterations per second in full node are around 155,000. Uh, that's kind of the current fastest uh, time lord on the network right now. Um, it is possible to go faster than that. Uh, a very modern CPU can do a little bit faster than that. But you'll find it's a pretty resource intensive thing to do. Um, as the storage levels off, the uh, VDF will then kind of level off back to its fastest number. So that means that storage is still kind of coming in and out right now. So the estimate could be like, in actuality, 90 terabytes. It could be. Uh, 99 terabytes, it's in that range. And then the way this all works, uh, the individual blocks have a lot of kind of noise in them that changes the exact estimate, but those are close. So uh, I'm gonna show you guys what I do to keep, keep life simple for clean windows. So I've got VirtualBox here and I've made a Windows 10 installer that's clean and I'm just gonna clone that. And that way I have a completely brand spanking new Windows box that's got nothing on it to show you guys how this works. Uh, th there was a comment in the Q&A about uh, creating multiple plots with the same index value. We're, we're going to be actually thoroughly reworking uh, how the plot file format works uh, completely. We're going to make some incompatible changes. 
Uh, part of that is going to be that every plot file is just going to have its own key internally to itself. So you won't be able to um, accidentally make duplicate uh, plot files even if you try to. Uh, the idea being that uh, if you use a plot file and you're concerned about a potential foliage reorg attacks, you should be able to just delete that plot file and it's just burned forever. Someone talked about the uh, Chia text saying that uh, NetSpace Chia dash net Chia space net space minus D48 must be a typo. It's not. That's the four hour estimate. Um, if you think about it, the dash D is how many blocks back you should look, and it's about 12 blocks per hour. Uh, you can also kind of get a sense of how the network's running because if you do a dash 48 like that, and it's only say three hours of time delta between the two, uh, then it tells you that you know more storage is coming on fast, or you know we've got a new new time warp, those kinds of things. Instead of waiting around for this, let me switch up and let's do a um, Linux install, which is very, very similar to the Mac install uh, or the WSL2 install. Uh, webinar inception. Okay. Everybody see my screen now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, someone pointed out that it doesn't say Chia NetSpace, it says chat NetSpace. And thank you, some autocorrect somewhere when we were developing, we will fix that. Okay. I'm going to start up a quick instance in Amazon. Actually, it looks like my clone is completed quicker, so let's do that instead. Okay, so we have now moved all of the install instructions and kind of the running instructions out to the repo wiki. Um, you can find that pretty easily either uh, on our front page or from the GitHub on the wiki page. Uh, install instructions are here. And hopefully, jump to whichever version you want to install. Windows now has two ways to install, and we'll show you both of them. You can either download the full native Windows installer. Um, this is a beta, so it requires you to do a little bit more command line than ultimately you'll need to do. Uh, but it does work Windows natively. Uh, the other way is with WSL2, and we'll show that install too, which has gotten much, much easier than this time. So I'm going to click on the link, and we'll go ahead and run that installer. I am uh, wired into a gigabit fiber connection, so everything should move quickly, even though I'm doing Zoom. Uh, Taylor Q asked, um, "What size? Uh, what kind of hard drive size would be best?" You know, your working uh, directories need about five times the out, out the completed plot file size. 
there's a uh, K uh, explainer on the wiki that kind of shows you what the final file size will be for each K value and what the interim size will be. Um, I will say that as we head toward mainnet, we're likely to use less uh, working space per final gigabyte. So that should get better, not worse. Um, you need kind of either like two or four terabytes of working space. Um, but then afterwards, you know, you're probably going to be storing smaller K values, but smaller here is 30 or 31. And the reason behind that is a couple. Um, first of all, you know, if you need your space back, it's better to, to be able to delete a 25 gigabyte file and, you know, only lose 25 gigabytes out of your total farm. Um, also, when we get to mainnet, uh, for reasons that Bram can explain, uh, the best practice would be to delete the winning plot when you do win and then replot it. And so you're going to want those plots to be on a smaller size. Uh, the other consideration is for right now and even in the future to a much lesser extent, uh, the number of plots on each drive will start to matter to how much IO you have to do your lookups. Um, it's going to get a lot better, but right now, for example, if you put more than about 50 plots on a drive, it'll start to slow things down. Okay. Uh, yeah, w whenever you uh, win with a plot, uh, there's some concern about uh, potential reorg. So like I just said, if you burn the key by deleting the plot file, that's gone. Uh, and also it's a bit of a, a, a privacy violation. If you win twice with the same plot, uh, that, that that's information that leaks out uh, to the blockchain. But if you go and just make a totally new plot that's not affiliated with the old plot anymore. And we're thinking about how to do this so that even your remote farmer can kind of trigger your uh, plotting machine to go make a new plot for you using your better hardware. Um, we have not code signing yet, so you'll get the little warning there. So say run anyway after uh, going past. Thanks, Don Kackman, for this amazing Windows installer infrastructure. Uh, really amazing uh, community ad. We're going to have to install a Windows native uh, C support for Visual C++, that's what that is. We install Python 3.7 right now, and Python will ask your permission separately to install. Someone asked if this is being recorded, and, and yes, it is. It is being recorded and we'll post a link uh, probably on YouTube. Unfortunately, YouTube wouldn't let us stream live today, uh, but we will put the replay up on YouTube as well. And uh, Ricardo has asked if the code coins are programmed uh, with the smart contract language or if they're an independent feature. And they are programmed with Chia Lisp, which is how all of the smart contracts are done. Uh, we actually have uh, this higher level language, which we are confusingly referring to also as Chialisp. So we, we, we're not, we might want to <coughs> straighten out our terminology in the future, but we have the like lower level CLVM stuff, uh, which is um, considerably harder to program in. And it's kind of like handwriting. Uh, it's kind of like programming and assembly. It winds up being much larger than if you let the compiler do the work. So we have, a higher level thing, which actually looks pretty similar, um, which compiles into uh, the, the lower level stuff. And uh, that it turns out already, even though it's a pretty rudimentary compiler at this point, works much, much better than hand coding everything. So our colored coins are written in the higher level language and we're gonna port everything else to the higher level language and we're going to continue to iterate on and improve the higher level language, including making it self-hosting. So getting a little fancy there. So we're complete. You'll notice two new things. I have to work around the webinar, apologies. We put two items on your desktop, the Chia wallet and a readme text about how to finish the install. There's also um, now a Chia section here in your recently added and then here in the start menu. So the first thing you have to do is you've got to open a PowerShell as administrator and you've got to set this uh, policy so that you can run shell scripts in your regular PowerShell. Hmm. Run as administrator. And I'm just gonna copy paste that right there. Once that's done, 
I'm going to close the administrative PowerShell. I'm going to open a regular PowerShell. Okay. So while I move the uh, panelists out of my way. Okay. So what you have now is Chia installed in the app data local programs Chia directory. I'm going to copy that and I'm going to paste that in PowerShell. And I'll literally take you right to that directory. You see in here, you've got all the binary wheels that make up the actual Chia blockchain, um, the install script we're about to run, and that readme that we're currently looking at in the pad over here. So on your first install, and only on your first install, you'll run that script right there, install.ps1. And of course, it fails. I think you clicked off a uh, are you sure on the administrative PowerShell. Ah, well, I did not give myself heightened permissions. Let's do that again. Thanks, Matt. Yes, one has to hit yes or all. That was the step I completely screwed up. It would not be a demo if it did not work somehow. I'm going to say all here, and now I can actually run a script in other PowerShell. Um, you do have to restart the PowerShell if you did that mistake because it uh, doesn't yet have the inheritance of that policy. But now it does. Again, just going to use the README to go to the right directory. What the install does is it opens Python. Python will create a what's called virtual environment. And what that is is a little directory inside the Chia blockchain directory that holds like Python and all the Python uh, necessary uh, libraries. Uh, and so whenever you want to try to run a Chia command, you need to be in the virtual environment. Um, and you'll see when you're in the virtual environment because what it will do is it will show you a little vim before your command prompt. What's happening here is all the various dependencies for the Chia blockchain are installed. If you look in the directory now, you'll see we've still got the wheels directory, the install, the readme, and this is a dependency of the install. But there's that vim, and you can see the green VENV right here. That shows you that you're in the environment, and so the Chia commands will work. So the first thing you do is you Chia init. What this does is create your initial configuration and looks to see if you've got beta 1, 2, or 3 installed before and tries to migrate. Um, if you were on beta 3, you do have to migrate the uh, public keys. Your private keys stay the same, but the public key changes just slightly uh, for our new uh, blockchain network. The next thing you want to do is you want to generate some keys. And all of that hides in your home directory in the .chia directory. And you can see that there's beta 1.0 before in there. Right now, there's only a config directory. Once I start Chia, you'll actually create a run directory, a DB directory, and a logs directory as well. So coming back to our readme, what we're going to do is we're going to start uh, the node in the background. Actually, you know what? I'm going to do a little bit differently. I'm going to actually plot a plot and farm instead. Um, a K26 would take us like 10 minutes or so. Uh, I'm going to do something a bit smaller. This command, K, is the uh, constant that determines the final size of each plot file. Um, we're going to do, for the purposes of demo, a K21. N is how many? Um, one means you will get a file named plot-0-21. Um, engineers like to count from zero. Uh, if you did this and did two in one again and you'd already plotted, you wouldn't get uh, another plot. You'd have to have in two, and then it will make you two plots, a total of two plots. So we'll look and see that you already had a plot. That's Obviously, it's going to be much slower for you. That, that's the parameter that's going away in the future, as I quite eagerly keep repeating, because I really want it to burn. <laughs> 
You can also specify your index with dash i, and indexes aren't special, just don't use two plots with the same index. But you could literally have like one machine that has indexes 1,000 plus, one machine has indexes 10,000 plus, one machine has 1 billion plus. It's all easy. Um, at final, you'll see that you now have in your plots directory, it's hiding in your home Chia directory, a plot. So now we're ready to farm. Starting a farmer also starts node, so you don't have to do those independently. And now farmer is running in the background. Um, I like this way. You have to allow Python access to the internet. I like running, uh, looking at the plots this way, or the log this way, so we can actually just kind of see it working. And what we're doing right now, if you can see, I don't know, it's gonna be easy to see on the webinar. Um, we're getting headers from the entire network first. Uh, you connect to a node and ask it what it thinks the LCA or last common ancestor is. And it goes, oh, I don't have that in my database, I better sync. And so it goes out and starts asking for headers. Once it has all the headers it thinks it needs, it starts asking for blocks. Thank you for the PR to fix the, our typo. That's very nice to uh, the community. We're not going to say chat, spit net space, we're going to say cheat net space. Thanks. And let's see, we're going to go up to block approximately 3,515. While that's running, I want to show you guys the other way to do this on Windows. We're going to install WSL2. Um, though, as I think about it, I'm going to have to reboot to do that, so I want to wait until the farmer here syncs up. Do you guys want to take questions about the hardware wallets? Yes. Well, so one question is, are you planning any partnership with hardware wallets to store Chia's? Um, Bram and Gene? Yeah, the quick answer is absolutely. Um, some of the hardware folks are actually investors in us, so I expect to get uh, hardware support pretty quickly. The big board, important point, though, is what we need for hardware is um, the DLS library. And it's now an IETF standard, almost an IETF standard. And that's going to mean that it's going to be very easy for all the hardware manufacturers to support it. And we're not the only ones who will be using that DLS library. So uh, it's pretty clear that most of the hardware guys are going to want to do that, regardless of just us, because you know things like Filecoin and others are going to be using DLS as well. One of the attendees asked, uh, does it mean that when a plot wins, the plot's no longer useful? Um, technically, it is still useful, but it's a bad idea to keep it around. Um, what you want to do is delete it and then plot a new one. Now, that doesn't really apply in testnet because, you know, these keys don't matter and we don't want you guys to have to regenerate plots now. Uh, later, when plotting is both faster, uh, you know, uh, on the new plot format, uh, then it may make sense for you to do that. And we're at block 850. Hey, Matt, let's uh, let's send some colored coins around because I think we're going to let this catch up in the background and then we can do the WSL2 after. Okay, cool. While you're sitting set up, uh, Murat asked, how do you plot on an external SSD? Um, Unless you're using Thunderbolt, I don't recommend it. Um, Thunderbolt does get you close to three gigabytes per second write. So that is absolutely useful. It's, uh, I think, USB 3.1 or 3.2. Um, but you can plot in any drive that your machine can see whether it's a good idea or not. Uh, basically, what you do is you tell the create plot script to use this, di this directory, whatever directory that is, uh, to uh, be your temporary directory and use this other directory or the same directory to be your final directory. So if you mount, you know, a uh, USB drive on Windows and it's like drive F, you know, you can use F as the drive that you're using to, uh, as temporary space, and then you can have it come back to C or whatever. Question, is it better to run this in a virtual machine or the normal desktop environment? Um, 
That is a more complicated question than it sounds. Uh, for plotting right now, it turns out that WSL2 on Windows is still a little faster than Windows Native to create a plot. So in that one instance, I would suggest for now that WSL2 is faster. Uh, otherwise, there's no real reason to do one or the other, um, especially as you get, a, get away from plotting. Uh, the nice thing about the Chia blockchain is that other than plotting, uh, all of the other uh, services don't really uh, tax any machine or any network. Um, that's not true for Time Lord, uh, but not a lot of people have to run Time Lords and you know, we'll cut, we got that covered. Uh, okay. While that's syncing up, I'm gonna switch to my wallet and Matt and I are probably gonna do a little color cleaning. Um, one thing to note about our colored coin implementation, this is a very small subset of what colored coins can be. Um, colored coins, since they're written in Chia list, can pretty much be anything your imagination sets. So like the issuer can have a limited issuance for a specific key. It can be a fixed amount. It can be an amount over time. It can be an amount uh, driven by an oracle if you trust that oracle. So, you know, this is just kind of a very basic generated colored, uh, send that color around and go from there. A uh, person asked about calculating the size uh, from K. Uh, the mostly accurate answer is that every time K goes up by one, the plot size doubles. Uh, and it's proportional to the actual observed file size on disk. Uh, it, technically speaking, that's not true. It's actually uh, proportional to two to the K times K plus one half. Uh, but at the sizes of K we're using, it's not really ranging, you know, below 20 or above 60. Uh, so for the most part, <clears throat> every time K goes up by one, the size doubles. Also for right now, you can do any K size you want. Um, to be competitive in a kind of 100 terabyte world, you're gonna need at least a kind of K30 or larger, or quite a few K30s. Um, you can kind of do the math. The K30 is 24.7 gigabytes usually. Um, each plot will not be exactly the same size. Uh, there are some compression differences between plots, but they'll be very close to the same size. Uh, when we go to mainnet, we're likely to have a minimum K size of 30, but that doesn't mean it'll kind of feel like it does today because we expect the new plot format and the new plot uh, plotter to be quite a bit faster per gigabyte. You know, we kind of hope to have uh, that your first decent plot could be plotted overnight or shorter and be somewhat competitive around the net launch. Okay, I've got my Chia wallet up. Just to walk you around that while we're waiting on everything else. Um, it tells you whether you're syncing or not. Um, currently we're synced. Your wallet tells you the last common ancestor. Uh, so often you'll see more tips over in your full node view than you see in your wallet, and that's intentional. 3514 is the last block that we all believe is a first final, like Bitcoin. Uh, don't have any opinion transactions right now. You can see I have quite a little bit of Chia. Um, we'll be changing this to the your screen. Pardon? I don't think your, your screen is being shared right now. Not shown? Let's make sure it's... There we go. Got him. Okay, everybody seeing the wallet? Perfect. So as I said, we're synced up to 3515. Um, my core Chia wallet is right here, and that's what you're looking at. These are colored coin wallets. So I've got Gene coin, demo coin, and one that builds. Over on full node, it's probably worth explaining this a little bit. Um, basically, your last common ancestor, the last block, that everybody agrees is a likely first confirmation. Um, currently, our consensus algorithm has three tips that everybody tries to farm. Um, right now, there are two tips fighting it out at block 3517, uh, now three. And what you can see is over here, the expected finish time based on how good their proofs of space are. Their proof of space 
times the current iterations per second lets you estimate how long or how many seconds a, a time is going to have to run against that big space. So this first one here, it looks like it'll be done at uh, five minutes from now, 11.40, um, 11.40, 44, 11.45. This means that this space is unlikely to win. And one of these two might win, but it's going to be close enough that I expect we'll probably have a tip fight again on top of that. So right now, transferring Chia is going to have to wait until the next least common ancestor moves forward. We'll probably make some changes here to be a bit more regular in time, but that's for a later date. Uh, yeah, the, I, I'm actually currently working on uh, potential changes here. So things we might do in the future is it might be that rewards, uh, that there are many more rewards that are smaller uh, pro proportionately by the amount more that we make them. Um, uh, and some other involved subtleties. <laughs> Uh, that yeah, it might make it so the amount of time between blocks is much more regular, and um, uh, and also uh, possibly make it so we're mostly just following one tip. Uh, okay, actually, I'm going to switch back now to uh, the Windows side. because that node has sync, or it's very close to syncing. You can run the wallet while it's syncing, but it's not much fun. We'll go ahead and start it up there. So Gene, there's been some questions about um, uh, whether like a K36 is more competitive than a K30. Also questions about um, uh, if they have a, a drive, should they use uh, more plots or just a, a few plots? Maybe we can talk about that. Sure. Um, so the first thing is, you know, is a K36 more competitive than a K30? Uh, strictly speaking, because it's larger, yes. But it is, the, you know, if you had the exact same gigabytes in K30s as a K36, you would be ha you'd have the exact same likelihood of winning the next block. So it's all about actually the space used, not the way you chop it up. Um, at mainnet, you're going to have a minimum plot size, and I suspect most people will choose that minimum plot size because it allows them to kind of recover their space if they need it in the smallest increments possible. Um, during current beta, you don't really want to have more than about 50 plots on an actual physical hard drive. If you got a RAID and you've got like five disks, you can have, uh, you know, 50 times five on that RAID and it'll work pretty well. Um, the issue is that right this second, we do a lookup on almost any type of uh, challenge. And in the future, we're going to filter that so that uh, you're not looking up things that are obviously not likely to win. And that lets you have a lot more plots per disk. So, you know, a little of this is what storage do you have and how do you want to store it? Most of it is that you'll probably want to be on the smaller end, just so that uh, it's easier for you to manage and maintain over the long haul. And then, uh, what was the other question again, Bill? The other question was whether uh, to use uh, lots of smaller um, K plot files or just one one large K plot file. And yeah, as I said, you know, it's uh, it's best probably to be you know on the smaller side, but I really wouldn't do anything a little smaller than like. Certainly small in K27, and as I said, you know, K30 is what main net's going to need. Uh, our, our minimum plot size, uh, especially for main net, is mostly based on making it impossible to do grinding attacks. So we're unfortunately going to have to set it so it's not really practical to, uh, to set up a plot in less than five minutes. Uh, that's just, and to the extent that uh, computers and computation get fast enough that you can, set up a plot file in less than five minutes, we'll probably have to do a soft fork to just not allow uh, super small Ks anymore, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but it, we're nowhere close to that right now. So uh, currently, uh, the, these, you know, 100 gigabyte or so uh, plot files couldn't, or nowhere near, couldn't possibly be done uh, that quickly. 
So uh, that's not much of an issue at all currently. So we'll, we'll, we'll see exactly what the minimum winds up being for mainnet and uh, how long that's going to be. It's a little bit of a trade-off on our part of how close to the edge we want to live in terms of allowing people to have better granularity versus the potential for maybe needing a soft fork in the future. So we'll see how that goes. So one of the questions was, can I plot on a Windows machine and use those plot files on Linux later? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, the plot files are totally cross-platform, totally platform independent. Uh, what you need is you need to bring the keys.yaml and the plots.yaml entries that uh, associate with that plot wherever you take them. Um, longer term, we're probably going to keep those keys actually in the plot, and so that'll be even easier to move between machines and OSs. Yeah, Gina, I just want to emphasize that um, in order to plot on a second machine, they need to move their keys.yaml file over to that second machine. That's right. So they have the same keys.yaml file on both machines. Yep. For now, you basically want to make sure you're keeping good backups of keys.yaml and plots.yaml. And you find those in your home directory, uh, .chia slash version slash conf. Uh, when do we plan on releasing mainnet? Uh, the best estimate is end of year. Um, it might be a little earlier than that. Uh, our goal is to be at a release candidate here probably the end of Q2, beginning of Q3. Uh, and a release candidate means that we feel like the uh, consensus algorithm is solid because we have a no hard forks policy. Uh, and once that's solid, then it's a question of just kind of how much easier can we make it and how much better can we make it before we actually go with it. It, it, We're in the end parts of polishing here. We have working versions of everything and are in the process of getting it to final final. Uh, it's not as final as I would like because I'm still working on it. <laughs> uh, but uh, in terms of the uh, fundamentally inventing new math parts, we have that very much under control now. So when we started this process, uh, neither VDFs nor proofs of space in the form we have them now were invented yet. And, uh, and we've done that. <laughs> as Bram likes to put it, don't start your product roadmap with invent new math here in two different places. Uh, Matt, one of the questions is, are colored coins what tokens are on Ethereum? Is Chia List used for programming smart contracts that manage colored coins? So, uh, Chia List controls not just colored coins, but all, all coins on Chia. Uh, and the colored coins do support inner smart contracts for, in Chia List, yes. Uh, tokens on Ethereum, uh, are a little bit different in, in practice, but it's the same concept, right? Colored coins are equivalent to tokens, yeah. And, you know, an important note about what Chia List can do, uh, because a colored coin can have an inner smart transaction, you can do things like create a uh, basic attention token that can be um, clawed back for two block confirmation. So if you make a typo, you can hold your actual typoed coin back and not lose the underlying value. Uh, all of the wallets that you see that we kind of talk about, like uh, rate limited wallet or um, authorized PE wallets, can be mixed and matched and mashed together inside of a colored coin. So you can have it so that the uh, Afghani dollar, I'm making this up completely, uh, can actually have rate limited wallets, can uh, make fees instead of in Chia in Afghani dollars, and that's done with our offer technology where the issuer sits on the other side and does swaps with people who say, hey, I've got some Afghani dollar that I need Chia for, they don't know that. And the other side says, here's your Chia, and that's the Chia fee that gets the transaction in through the mempool. Uh, important to note here, uh, all these like things where we talk about how you could do X, Y, and Z, uh, generally speaking, uh, that means we haven't implemented it yet. We, we've built you know, the, the, the groundwork, we've demonstrated the software development, either a software development environment that enables this, but we've only kind of scratched the surface of stuff you can build. So if you're at all interested be, in being a software vendor on, a, a, on Chia, now would be a good time to learn Chia Lisp and start hacking away. We expect Chia Lisp to be kind of call it 95% the same when we go to mainnet. So, you know, whatever you write now, it's going to take very minor changes and maybe no changes at all, depending on what you're doing. Will there be any rewards for testnet farmers that continue when mainnet comes on stream or will testnet rewards not count? Um, there will be no uh, direct rewards for testnet farming. 
Um, we have thrown around and we'll probably do some fun things like maybe a Chuck E. Cheese style store where you can redeem your Chia for a hat, a uh, straw hat, of course. Uh, that's one of the things we're probably gonna throw together here. Um, we may also do some just kind of fun things of like the person who farms the most Chia between block X and block Y wins a uh, 12 terabyte disk, right? Uh, but once we change the plot file, I wanna make sure everybody knows that the current plot format is not the final plot format. Um, we hope to do that once and only once because we know uh, that you guys are investing time and energy in that. We don't wanna replot more than a single time. Um, once we change that plot format though to the final plot format, the farm you have on late test net will be able to farm immediately on mainnet. Once we launch mainnet, we also plan on having a window of somewhere between two and four weeks, maybe a little longer, maybe a little shorter, where no transactions are allowed, but we are uh, handing out farming rewards so that the farm, uh, the farmers can get, first of all, priority access to Chia. They'll be the only people who have Chia outside of the pre farm that the company owns, and the company will not be selling Chia. Um, and also to let everybody get over, get stabilized, have a real sense of what that main net uh, storage size looks like uh, initially. We also then hope to have some major exchanges list the coin once transactions are allowed shortly thereafter. Question is, uh, for an ordinary user who only has a 250 gigabyte SSD they can spare without even be viable on the net or visible on the network. Basically, what do you think the total amount of storage should be so that the probability of getting an X block isn't essentially zero? Um, there's two different answers in here. I mentioned SSD for plotting because it's a great uh, medium to plot on. It is not what you should store your farm on. You should store your farm on cheap old USB 2 disks and you know things that you're worried might just die uh, because you can always replot whatever sector died. So you know you want your farm to be on the cheapest storage you have around, and you just want to use SSD because it'll make your plotting process you know gigabytes per uh, hour faster, right? Um, Right now, uh, you know, you can kind of do the math. One terabyte has a one one hundredth of a chance of winning each next block, right? Um, and anytime you want to, you can look at Chia space net space, and it'll give you an estimate, which is probably within about 5% of the truth. Uh, and you'll be able to get a sense of how many gigabytes or terabytes are there. But at the same time, um, we are likely to support pooling out of box. So uh, you'll have kind of smooth rewards, at even smaller sizes. And due to the nature of this, you know, even if you're only making a few cents a year on the unused storage space you have laying around, it's kind of worth doing. Um, you know, you kick off, you do these plots at night when you're not using the machine, and your machine's gonna be on and spinning that disk anyway, you might as well make money on the piece that isn't being used right now. And if you're using the smaller plot sizes, you can obviously kind of delete them as you go. Uh, also, uh, in terms of just the, the noisiness of it, about uh, whether you might, wind up being below the thresholds where you just are, your expected number of wins is zero. Uh, we are going to, well, two things. So we might maybe uh, multiply the number of rewards by 16 in the future and divide the, the amounts commensurately. I'm currently working on that. Also, uh, we will be supporting pools and have uh, the, a hook for pools and a basic implementation of pools out. Uh, that's another thing that I'm working on iterating on, but our preferred pool protocol uh, will make it so that all the pool does is smooth out rewards and kind of make sure that they're time lords for the thing and not actually make the blocks themselves. So uh, getting rid of a bunch of the concerns about uh, centralization uh, that, that happen with pools currently in Bitcoin. So uh, we are now synced up on Windows. Um, you can kind of see it farming away when it's saying uh, new unfinished block to peer. It's basically sending a new potential winner around. Um, Harvester will pop up once in a while and say, you know, here's my proofs of space. We're not likely to have a lot of good proofs of space with this K21. In fact, I would be surprised if we had any at all. Uh, it'll be a while before this one comes around. Again. I'm gonna control C out of the log tail and I'm going to turn on the server that's needed to let you run the wallet on Windows.
and I'm going to now restart the wallet. And the Chia wallet's either on your desktop or, you know, up here in your start menu. Wallet has to sync separately. It keeps a separate database because it's more interested in transactions than it is the rest of the node. But it's a pretty quick process. And you'll see full node here is now fully synced up and running. Um, obviously, in future versions, you're not going to have to necessarily use the command line at all on Windows. You're going to run this, and then there are going to be things that are more than, hey, go read the readme in these various tabs to let you plot, manage your harvester, and manage your farmer. Um, one thing to kind of note, we have harvesters and farmers and full nodes, and they're a little bit different in each. The harvester is kind of the minimum amount of software you need to run on a machine that has plots on it that you're farming. So you could run a uh, Raspberry Pi with just Harvester and a plots YAML file, and it'll connect to one of your farmers that you set up. Uh, so like maybe on another central server in your office instead of the Pi, you know, downstairs. Um, and now you may still have plots on that farmer too, so it can run a Harvester too, and now you've got two Harvesters running on different machines farming all those plots simultaneously. So you can kind of build a network of Harvesters that kind of report into the farmer. Farmer needs a full node, Generally, you want to run your own full node if you're farming, just so you know you have transactions up to the minute. But you could use a public uh, full node because farmer only needs to know what's the new challenge and then gossip out those uh, responses. Now, also, you know, key management will mean that you'll, your farmer and your private full node are where your private keys are likely to live. And so that way, you don't necessarily have to have your keys spread all around all the harvesters. You can have them on the one machine that actually uh, you know, you care about, if you will. And I just want to add, Gene, that we support uh, TLS authentication between harvesters and farmers. So there's no way for anybody else to access your plots. And uh, more, longer term, we hope to like do Let's Encrypt and that kind of thing where you can actually, you know, create uh, actual CA signed certificates and, you know, choose whether you trust those and those kinds of things. Uh, right. right now, we kind of generate you a trusted one. Yeah, technically speaking, we don't have this set up yet, uh, but uh, in the future, we're gonna make it so that the the malleable keys on the plots are actually two of two, where there's one of the keys is in the plot and the other key is sitting in the farmer. So if the plot deletes its half, then, then it's completely toast, but the plot can't actually be used by any other farmer because the uh, no one else can just connect to it and pretend to be the farmer and get utility out of it because they don't have the farmer's part of the two of two key. Not implemented yet though. Yep, um, and also, you know, as far as uh, access control between the various nodes and farmers and such, we're gonna have it so you can be pretty fine grained. You can do it at the TLS level, you can do it inside the protocol with the keys that you're actually using on the various pieces. Um, you know, you can restrict it by IP. You know, your light wallet on your phone may have a lot more rights to your full node than the network does generally, right? So all that's kind of coming, some of that's already in here. Uh, question, what happens when the testnet coins were accumulated up the point of mainnet, those things get blown away. Um, and I cannot guarantee we won't have soft forks that uh, cause us to restart the chain between now and mainnet, we already have one. Um, hope to not have to do that, uh, but at the same time, we're not as worried about restarting the chain as we are about trying to keep it the one clock clock. Uh, plot back. One plot format change. Matt? Will Chia so, support non-fungible coins, unique ID tokens? For example, issuing certificates on Geo blockchain. So at the moment, the colored coins we have are very similar to the non-fungible coins, but you can actually sp split them up below one. Uh, mm -hmm. It is very possible for us to do a version which cannot be uh, divided uh, like you're asking, but it's not, it's not done yet. And uh, how will websites or apps communicate with Chia blockchain? Will there be any JavaScript client-side framework? Um, there's already JSON RPC and full node. Um, it's uh, about five or six different endpoints. Uh, two of them are kind of listed to get you started at the bottom of the readme file in the Chia-blockchain GitHub. And if you go look in the uh, source RPC, you can see in the server, what are immediately implemented right now. Uh, for example, between 1.3 and 1.4, I added a git block header hash by block height. So you can kind of say, hey, uh, for block 3518, what's header hash? And then you can look up what you to show uh, the actual block for 3518 from its header hash. 
what's the plan to convert Chia into currency? Um, the market will decide what the price of Chia is. We have no earthly idea. We kind of think we'll be at least the top 20 cryptocurrency by coin market cap, but exactly how people will want to calculate our coin market cap isn't exactly clear either. Uh, but you know, that is going to be answered in that first four weeks when only farmers are doing farming rewards. However, that said, I do expect quite a few uh, well-known exchanges to make be available for you to be able to use dollars to buy from this too. But you know, right now, the only way to get Chia in the near term is going to be to farm. Someone asked, you know, I've got two K29s uh, and I haven't won yet. So two K29s would be like 25 gigabytes versus 100 terabytes. So that's a 0.025 chance if I'm doing my math off, off the top right. So, you know, it's going to take a lot of blocks before you, you roll those dice. But you will possibly win if you have enough time. Yeah, it's just, it may take you days. <laughs> Uh, the question, do we think that uh, coin market cap will calculate the pre-farm and the market cap? Uh, I think so. I mean, the naive way is to take, obviously, our pre-farm and the total number of coins issued to date, and that's the total coins outstanding. Uh, we're planning on having the pre-farm be in three logical wallets, and maybe quite a few more wallets than that, where one of them is very cold uh, and takes physical uh, interaction. So, you know, somewhere between a third and 50% of the pre-farm will be locked away because we won't be needing it for dope in the near term. Uh, and then we're going to have a warm wallet and a hot wallet. So it's possible uh, that, you know, the warm and hot will be the only number that people add in the coin market cap. Not quite sure. Uh, the less coins outstanding, the more the Pichia per dollar price is. So some, in some ways, the naive evaluation is maybe the smarter one. Um, and we're going to be pretty transparent about which wallets the pre farm is in. Uh, you know, we can't be necessarily transparent about who we're making Chia loans to, just because our customers don't necessarily want to be known. Um, but you can assume there are folks like market makers and people trying to deploy real Chia applications. Will there be a finite amount of Chia? Uh, no, but it is a very well understood issue and schedule. So for the first five years, we're going to give out 16 Chia coins every five minutes. Then we'll have, uh, we'll have happenings. Uh, we'll do four of those. So you'll go 16, eight, four, and then two Chia. We will continue to issue two Chia through to the heat death of the universe. Um, that gets you down to an inflation rate of about 0.0504% in about 40 years. But you can always kind of calculate what the outstanding Chia is going to be plus or minus a few Chia at any time in the future. Um, there are real security concerns with having fees be the only block reward. That's three happenings, by the way. Three happenings, yeah. Hey, Bram, could you talk about the, uh, the reason that we think fees are important? Uh, uh, yeah, well, the, the inherently you need a, a market for fees. Uh, the, the the way you avoid the blockchain getting full of spam garbage is you make it so people actually have to pay for this resource of occupying space in the blockchain until the end of time. And so the way people, the, the way the market works for that is when there's scarcity in it, when there's more demand, uh, fees go up. And uh, this is just basic microeconomics uh, and the some things claiming oh well we'll just crank up the size of the blockchain forever I believe is completely foolish uh, because uh, it's very important that it be cheap and lightweight to run a truly full node so it really is a decentralized system and not a you know here are the three full nodes in the universe and everyone just kind of trusts the uh, situation. So one question is, if I had six terabytes, would it be viable? Uh, today on mainnet, you six terabytes would give you a 6% chance of winning every single block. So yeah, it'd be extremely viable. Uh, what six terabytes will mean on mainnet is kind of not known yet. Uh, there are a couple variables. One of those is with the new plot file format and the speed ups, it may mean that it's easier to get a terabyte plotted than it currently is. So it might mean that there's more. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it's unclear whether people are going to be especially once we get towards mainnet, you know, using space that they just have laying around versus buying. We think people will be competing with people who have space laying around, and that's going to make it be a little less economically interesting to buy new space for it. Um, 
you know, one of the economic things to think about is that it costs about $16 to buy uh, a terabyte of space right now. And it costs probably about a dollar a year to uh, run it, you know, electrical costs, you know, just the other things. If you're spending it anyway, you've already sunk that cost. And so anything you get back from that is a win. But, you know, drives kind of have a three-year lifetime. Obviously, it can be longer than that, but that's a good way to model it. And so, you know, we kind of expect that farming rewards will probably get around three or four dollars per terabyte pretty quickly if it's all rational. But the thing is, you know, who knows what the Chisachia will do. Uh, previous coin launches like Stellar or um, Litecoin and others, you know, those have uh, moved much higher uh, over early times than would otherwise economically make sense. So. Uh, how are transaction fees calculated, Graham? Um, right now, our uh, transaction fee estimation is non-existent. <laughs> this is something we ha have to work on in the future. It it's pretty much the same kind of thing as Bitcoin, that uh, you can look at you know, current fees in the mempool, current size of the mempool, recent transaction history, and do some replace by fee stuff, and have reasonable strategies for making reasonable fees. Uh, we do have a nice feature in Chia that if you put in a transaction and it doesn't go through because the fee isn't high enough, uh, in addition to doing replace by fee, uh, you can actually have a sibling pay. So you, you can make it so that um, if like someone sends you a transaction where they didn't pay a fee, they just said, here's my payment to you, and they didn't introduce it to the blockchain or they didn't do it with a large enough fee, you can actually make another transaction that declares it's dependent on that one. Uh, and that one can pay the higher fee. And if the first one goes through before the second one happens, the second one becomes invalid and doesn't wind up paying the fee. And this can be done even without, as a, as a sibling without uh, having to do a, a child's pays. So, so the child can remain locked up, which is good if you don't have immediate access to that. You know, one of the things we talk about is potentially even having like uh, one or two block clawbacks be a default when you create a new coin, uh, just so that, you know, if you make a typo, you can always pull things back. And there's some neat new things you can do with the Okay. That's, so that's one about, of the things we don't have implemented yet. <laughs> yeah. no, the, the neat thing about GeoLisp is there's a Turing complete language to do interesting things on a blockchain. Here. Hey, Matt, let's switch gears now that we've synced up and let's try to do some color coins. Cool. Um, I'm going to do one thing, which is I'm going to send myself some coins in Windows so we have some coins over here to use. Uh, the way you do that, you go down here and you go, hey, give me a new address for the current wallet. I'm going to copy that. And uh, I'm going to go over to my other wallet. And I will switch the share so you can see my other wallet. And down here, I'm going to go, okay, I'm going to send some Chia to that address. And let's see, I'm going to send 10 in one transaction. Due to some very detailed in the weeds uh, reasons, I'm actually going to send a couple transactions that I have a couple different coins in the wallet. I've now got 13 Chia on the way to my Windows machine. If you scroll down, you can see that I've got pending transactions. Also, um, if you're a farmer, this is where your rewards will show up. These were things I sent to others. Some of you on testnet have gotten coins out of this vault. Um, this is a farming reward. Right now, just for d demo beta reasons, uh, you win 14 Chia per five minutes in block reward and two Chia in fees. Obviously, there'll be 16 Chia plus fees once we get the main. Uh, it, it's actually a split. It actually is 16 Chia right now. It's just splitting it among two different uh, addresses. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we don't have any meaningful transaction fees right now. Yeah. They're all zero at the moment. So outbound transactions that don't have an, a, a last common ancestor will sit here in pending. Ted, do you want to explain uh, LCA to him, Gene? 
Go ahead, Bill. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so um, we have these transactions impending uh, because if you go back over to the full node, uh, you'll see down at the bottom uh, there it is the LCA, mm -hmm. the, the last common ancestor. And we have to keep track of uh, various uh, tips in the chain um, because we're not really sure which tip is going to be the fastest and which tip is going to win out. Um, so until, until those tips resolve into one common ancestor, um, we can't really confirm a transaction. So when you send out a, um, a transaction, uh, you're basically looking for the time you sent the transaction to be eclipsed by an LCA. And when the LCA eclipses the time that you sent the transaction out, that's when your transaction will be submitted and confirmed. Yep, and it looks like uh, right the second, uh, 1236 guy is gonna win. I believe it's not gonna be 1236, it's gonna be faster than 1236. A dramatic drum roll for arrival. It's gonna take a little while though. Uh, there, we're still pending. So maybe we should ask, answer some questions until this, uh, this yep. confirms. Bram, do you have an idea about how many transactions per second we're going to support? Um, probably about 20. <laughs> It depends on the type of transaction, uh, but for vanilla transactions, probably 20, roughly speaking. Uh, one of the questions is, um, how, can you describe how to do uh, plotting on you know, one directory versus a final directory the other way? Uh, the easy way to kind of show that, If you do chia dash create plots and you give it a dash help, it'll show you the various flags. Um, index will be automatically calculated out of your plots YAML for you, so you don't have to mess with that. In is how many more plots to plot at this plotting session. K, obviously the size. Um, Tempter is the directory, like, so, you know, if you had uh, on Windows, your uh, NVMe drive was on F, you'd say dash T F colon plots slash, right? Um, and then your final dir here points you to, you know, say the USB hard disk at, you know, G, right? So it's basically, you know, create. You'd say dash T tempter dash uh, D final order. Does that make sense? I'm not sure we actually uh, support uh, two different drives at this moment, right, Gene? But um... yeah, there there is a like weird implementation detail where your temp drive will actually have the final written to it first, and then the final will be moved. We'll be fixing that in the next weeks. Uh, other questions. Uh, in terms of securing wallets, we're uh, going to support uh, hardware uh, secure wallets in the future, working with vendors on that already. Uh, are we going to have human readable addresses? Uh, uh, basically, no. Uh, you're, you're, you're free to grind on making band D addresses if you want, but that's pretty much the same kind of thing as in Bitcoin. Uh, the addresses are, you know, there's, there's, they're cryptographically secure keys. They're not human readable. The we're uh, probably do some metadata around colored coins and other things, and kind of a just standard way that you can describe them with JSON. Oh yeah, yeah, and also there will be local names for everything that that you will have. So so it's not like you'll be seeing these uh, cryptographically secure keys all the time. It's just you have to somehow from somewhere get the cryptographically secure key and assign a human readable name to it, uh, which will then be how it's displayed to you. Um, and it can be made fairly automated, but it's not like someone's going to write down, you know, 
Bram on a piece of paper, and then you can send Chia to Bram. That's not going to happen. Uh, so question, uh, why Chia? Uh, oh boy, uh, there, there's a whole bunch of uh, things here. Uh, so uh, Chia, at a high level, uh, we're aiming to make better money. Uh, cryptocurrencies are good at being money. Uh, we're trying to make it better. Uh, so uh, there's kind of two broad buckets of things that we're doing really well. Number one, instead of proof of work, we're using proof of space and time, uh, which is uh, uh, less wasteful because it's not burning so much electricity uh, and it's more distributed across more entities and it lets all of you participate. It's not economically practical to, uh, to mine Bitcoin, but farming Chia just with your own hard drive is totally doable and will continue to be doable in the future. What, you know, how, how much rewards you'll get for it, we don't know, but you'll get something or have some chance of getting something. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we also have a better on-chain programming environment for doing better smart transactions. So <clears throat> the general flavor of what we're doing uh, with that, what we're emphasizing in terms of our development efforts, are uh, kind of two things. Uh, one of them is better vaults, better just custody arrangements for your money so it doesn't have this carrying around suitcases full of $100 bills feeling that Bitcoin does. Uh, so things like having a wallet that can only pay to authorized payees, having a wallet that can only pay out at a certain rate, all those things, things that are much more sophisticated than just multi-sig. And another one, the one that we're demonstrating now, is better support for colored coins. So th these are you know, the analog of Omni protocol or ERC-20 tokens, but much, much easier to do as in like you can today just go press a button and start one. Uh, and you can change the issuance schedules and they support inner smart transactions so you can build those vaults I was just talking about uh, in your colored coin. Uh, yeah, and, and all of these things are very uh, lightweight uh, and not expensive uh, on the blockchain. So or a, a better platform for being money in general. In the background. Hey, Brent, uh, oh, sorry, do you, do you want to talk a little bit more about the um, the uh, the, the power or uh, electricity differences between uh, Bitcoin and Chia and also maybe the, the, the uh, decentralized uh, issues? Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the, the electricity usage of Bitcoin is actually kind of special. There's no comparable thing in Chia. Uh, it's not like a factor that we're taking things down. It's really a qualitative difference as in Bitcoin wastes power and Chia doesn't. <laughs> um, the... Uh, the Fundamentally, uh, the way you secure a Nakamoto consensus is you have something that can be locally verified that was done that required some resources to do. Uh, and what tends to happen is these all boil down to burning power, to using up electricity. And whoever has custom hardware and the cheapest source of electricity uh, basically wins over everybody else. They're the only ones who can do this economically. Uh, it's very, very hard to find any other thing that doesn't degenerate into this. So even like memory hard proofs of work and stuff wind up not working again. Uh, but there is this exception that you can use proof of space. And turns out for security reasons, you need to mix it together. I have proof of space and proof of time. That's our VDFs. Um, however, if you invent a whole bunch of new math and do things really, really carefully, you can get this to work. Now, from an economic standpoint, there's a question of what resource is being burned here. And the answer is it's a resource that was already burned. It, you've already put resources into build, building the storage capacity that you have, and you're underutilizing it. And so this allows you to leverage that it, into this uh, securing a blockchain activity without any additional cost to it. One of the questions is, uh, don't we think that uh, people who can, who can afford to buy huge amounts of storage will do so to farm Chia? Um, we don't think so. Uh, the issue is, is that there's something like, I think it's 60 petabytes of storage bought every year. There is a tremendous amount of unallocated storage in the universe. And it's gonna be far more efficient and effective to take the space that you have extra of and farm that. So you're always gonna be competing with somebody who has a sunk cost of zero. So we think that's gonna put some limits on how much storage will get allocated. But we also think that's really, really decentralized. Um, 
you know, it turns out like people think, oh gosh, the big cloud providers will be the biggest farmers. And it turns out that they don't have much spare farm, farm space. Um, I was talking to one of the uh, big, big cloud providers about uh, their unused storage. And their response to me was, unused storage, do you have storage to sell me? I can't buy enough storage. They have people 24 seven, 365 racking new drives. So they're not gonna farm. They don't have spare storage. They don't wanna have spare storage. They wanna just in time that storage in and sell it for a much higher price for you know S3 costs and not for farming. But folks like, you know, maybe even Disney when they're between Pixar movies can take that render farm and farm it in between. Um, you know, backing up your farm to tape and restoring from tape is actually a rational thing to do uh, if you have storage that you temporarily need to do something else with. So we think that there's going to be a whole lot more people with kind of random storage laying around. They're going to be the mass farmers on our network. Uh, th that's marginal cost of zero. Sunk cost is pretty high, actually. <laughs> yeah, sunk cost is already there. Um, one question, describe the IPO. Uh, we do plan on taking a company public because the pump company owns the pre-farm and we want that pre-farm to have good corporate governance. Uh, what we plan to do, because we've seen kind of a positive response to this plan, is actually to do a more traditional uh, IPO. And we'll probably start that process shortly after mainnet launch and shortly after the transaction launch. Because once we have a kind of balance sheet valuation, it becomes a lot easier for us to then go to the financial world and you know, explain what we're worth. Um, we will be doing certain things to make sure that farmers and others can participate in that offering. Um, we may run it as an auction. There's some open questions about that. Obviously, all of this is caveat market conditions and the timing it takes to get through with the SEC and others, but we're very confident that we can get that done. Are colored coin transactions distinguishable from standard Chia transactions, or are they all look the same? So, um, depends what you mean by distinguishable, basically. Um, standard Chia transactions are still locked up with Chia list puzzles, and when you spend a coin, you reveal the puzzle. So, if you're paying attention, then you can look and see which of, those, which of the transactions published uh, were using the colored coin type puzzles but it's still all using the same mechanisms. So kind of depending on your definition, really. What are plans to become more user friendly for using Chia? Uh, <laughs> wow, what, what isn't going to get more user friendly? Um, first of all, you know, we provide wallets, not because we think we're the best wallet manufacturer by any means. Um, it's that you, know, you need a good test environment, a good basic environment. We're going to be investing pretty heavily in making sure that farming, harvesting, and plotting user interfaces are really easy to use and very cross-platform. But we're probably not going to be the person who gives you the best Chia wallet, certainly not the best Chia light client. So, you know, we're hoping that others will step up to that and start building wallets or extending their existing wallets to support Chia as well. So that's kind of what you should expect. But there's a bunch of kind of core differences to how Chia works that are going to make using Chia so much easier. Um, right now, when I transfer Bitcoin to sell off of our uh, cold wallet, there's this moment where I've checked it three or four times, but I still got to hit enter, and hopefully I don't make a $500,000 typo. We don't think that's the way a cryptocurrency should work. So we're going to do things like make it so I could claw that back for two block transactions. And that's pretty neat because the recipient sees it's coming, knows it's valid, can see in the contract that they don't have complete control of it yet, but it already starts confirming and therefore has less likelihood of being a double spin. So, you know, it's those kinds of changes that are gonna make Chia a lot easier to use from your models. I just wanted to add that, um, that you know, we are a um, Apache licensed uh, open source uh, Git repository. So we welcome PRs as well, if people want to improve things. Yeah, the whole Chia uh, Windows installer was a community PR from Don Kackman. Thank you again, man. Um, a question about supporting uh, atomic transactions. The answer is yes, absolutely. We most definitely uh, support uh, atomic transactions. Uh, it, actually, we, we support aggregated signatures and it's really uh, normal to stable stuff together. Uh, so, so just in the normal course of things, if, you have a, if you're trying to send a payment uh, and you need to use two coins, uh, in order to do that payment. Uh, what this kind of looks like on the blockchain is you have one coin that 
makes the output and the change, and the other coin that just gets burned, it just disappears. Uh, but its output disappearing, uh, its input being added to the transaction makes the sums of the inputs and outputs add up so it all works. And in fact, uh, our colored coins uh, uh, work this way under the hood that we rather painstakingly uh, made it so that uh, a, a transaction aggregation uh, works in our colored coins. Um, and that enables this offers feature that I believe we're going to get up to here, where someone can make an offer saying, I'd like to trade this amount of Chia for this amount of colored coin or vice versa or anything, or trade two different colored coins for each other and make an offer which doesn't add up. It's a partial, unbalanced, not valid transaction, but anyone else out there can make the things add up together and staple these together and add it to the blockchain and it will work. So yeah, we most definitely... Uh, support atomic transactions. Hey Matt, let's get going on uh, making a transaction because uh, my wallet's transfer, as everybody can see, I've got 13, excuse me, Chia over here on the Windows wallet. Okay, uh, do, you want me, do you want me to make you an offer? However you'd like to go. Um, well, I suppose, firstly, we should uh, make sure that you have uh, signed up to be a part of the same color as me, right? Yep, let's do that. So uh, for this, I'm going to send you some information about uh, demo coin. Uh, so let me post that color description to you. I'll do that through Keybase. And what you're not seeing off screen is I'm now copying this uh, URI like thing. I'll show it to you here on the Windows desktop before I do anything with it. We're gonna create a new wallet. Chia color coin style wallet. And input existing color. This is the little string that I got sent. And just so everybody can see that, I'm gonna put it in Notepad too. Yeah, maybe scroll back to show the prefix. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do. I'm just gonna do this. So it looks like, sorry guys, I'm going back and forth back to Windows. So color description equals and then a hash, okay? And that was just pasted into input existing color. We're gonna add some metadata to this so it'll actually like have a suggested name. Right now it's a colored coin, but I'm gonna ask Matt, hey Matt, what are you calling this? I'm gonna use it the same locally. I'm, I'm calling this demo coin. Demo coin. And uh, if you'd like, I can share my screen while I make an offer. Yep. I'm prepared to sell you some demo coin. Okay, let me stop sharing. Oh, it's telling me the host has disabled attendee screen sharing. I think I can I make give it. Explicit permission. Yep. Well, I'll make you the host for right now. How about that? That'll work. That's good. All right, share the desktop. So here we have my wallet. And you can see I've got some Chia and some demo coin. Uh, we've only have five demo coins, so it's pretty rare. So when I'm, uh, what I can do is I can go to the trade manager and choose to sell some demo coin. So we're going to select the demo coin. Now, I don't want to sell very much. So I'm going to sell one demo coin. And for that one demo coin, I think that I'll ask for 20 cheer. Don't ask for 20. <laughs> do you, do you not have, do you I not only have, have 20? 13. <laughs> oh I'll, I'll, I'll ask for 10. Yeah. All right. Real time auction, folks. One demo coin for 10 cheer. And you can see that it's listed 
uh, what we want. So then we're going to save this and we'll put this on my desktop. And I'm going to call it uh, democoin.offer. Offer successfully created. And now I will uh, send this file to you if you want to share your screen again. I think you need to make me a host. Uh, yes, okie dokie. Yeah, uh, it's, it's worth noting you can post this offer anywhere in any public website or whatever, and anybody can accept it. You can yeah, if, you, if, you, if you open up the offer file, you can kind of show what the format actually is. Okay. Uh, you, you're keybasing it to me, I assume? Yes, if that's okay. all right. Absolutely. You can, you can also put it in Pastebin or WhatsApp or however you like to send your text around. Okay, I'm downloading it. And I need to move it around a little bit on my Mac so I can get it on my Windows machine. Hang on one second while I do that. Actually, paste spinning it might might make that quicker. It might be easier, yeah. But the, no, I've got the file here, so let me just move it. Um, We're going to make a default website that you can just press a button and it'll upload the offers to it in the future <laughs> for the whole world to just be able to download these things. Uh, but haven't done that yet. Yep. But it's worth adding the offer could be listed anywhere. Let me move some files around. And uh, we'll switch over to share windows. Okay. Um, Make make a text file locally and paste the data into it. Uh, by the way, the usage of Lisp here is uh, very strongly motivated by the underlying thing. When people code in Solidity, they have never-ending problems of reentrancy uh, that cause all manner of issues. Uh, the way we have things set up, we have no reentrancy. It is not a thing. You cannot build reentrancy if you try <laughs> in our environment. <laughs> and uh, in terms of things like colored coins, part of why we support inner smart transactions well is if you have an inner smart transaction, it needs to be sandboxed. And when you have no side effects, everything is sandboxed. Okay. Democoin.offer is now where I wanted to be. So that's the contents of the demo coin. But what matters is. Hey, Matt, what are all those eight zero constants in the whole thing? I'm not sure off the top of my head. Huh. <laughs> I can look into it if you want. <laughs> yeah. Oh, drag and drop this windows. Hang on, folks. And there's my offer. You can see I'll get one of the color and I have to pay 10 Chia. So you know what? Sure. So that's now in the mempool. We can't really speed up the mempool, unfortunately. Yep. <laughs> 
<laughs> five minute blocks are five minute blocks. You should be able to see it in the pending transactions. Yeah, on, when you look at wallet, you'll see a pending transaction for the negative 10 Shia. There's actually enough stuff going on in the in the blockchain right now that our uh, test net farming machines that we set up uh, can't actually 51% attack the network anymore or actually even come close, <laughs> which is cool, but it causes a little bit of headaches when we're trying to do maintenance sometimes. <laughs> yeah, we will never farm on uh, mainnet. Um, we will farm test net chains just because we have to get some stability to them initially, but we will not compete with our farmers. We will run time limits. We will be running lots of time limits. Yeah. All over the world. So there's a, there's a couple of questions. Uh, Mikhail says QR codes would be nice. And we already have QR codes for addresses, but the office just have a little bit too much information. Someone could do a QR code, which is a reference to what, somewhere else where the offer information is, but there's just too much information in an offer right now. We're thinking about um, adding a URL or uh, to an offer as a kind of standard thing. And that URL would go to a uh, JSON file. And that JSON file can be the color description as well. So you know, you may be able to hand somebody a URL, they can add that URL to the wallet, it will automatically kind of set everything up. And you know, it pulls the metadata there, including things like description and the English language of what goes on in the contract and all that kind of stuff. Kristen uh, wants to see uh, actually how the colors are being created, uh, asks if they're coming from thin air. Uh, they're not, um, and we can, we can demonstrate that as well. I just did it off camera for speed and brevity, but that probably wasn't the best idea. Yeah, you, you can in fact just create a new coin whenever you feel like it. You need some Chia to do it um, uh, because uh, there, there needs to be something in there to uh, hold balances and also just pay the initial transaction fees when it's created. However, we, we have uh, decided in the interest of making colored coins work well to make it so that each Chia is one trillion uh, mojo. So you don't need to use a lot of Chia to make it so that your colored coin has plenty of subdivisibility into smaller bits. A, a, a mojo is the, uh, uh, is the Chia equivalent of a Satoshi. Uh, Dean, while we wait, do you want to make a, uh, a color coin with some mojo? Would you uh, like your screen there, uh, Matt? Yeah, I can do this uh, if you've got to make me host again. Yep, give me one second. Bonus points to anyone who's old enough to get the Mojo reference. Yeah, but just the Mojo, Matt. All right, uh, do I have the ability? No, not yet. Uh, now you do. Oops, nope, I missed it. Nope. <laughs> Hey, Bill, can you make Matt host, please? <laughs> oh, actually, you know what? Maybe Matt shouldn't because he might spend your uh, your uh, offer. No. You, I know. If I'm making a new one because I'm uh, I'm making it out of cheer. Oh, I was giving okay. color coins. Either way, Bill, you either make me or Matt host because you've got control now. <laughs> I do? You do. I accidentally missed. Oh, boy. All right. Let's see here. Somebody commented, my face is hairy. Yes, one pandemic beard. Uh... Let's see. In um, attendees? The, the three dots in the top right of my, what's it? Click that. Well, you want participants and panelists, and then in panelists, you can hover over and. <laughs> All right, three dots in the top right. OK. Um, yeah. And then make host. Uh, I have mute, start, rename, uh, at hide, and hide self view. Go to participants. Hit <laughs> the participants to the bottom, you know. OK, participants, yep. yep. Now you see us. Uh, I'm just, analysts. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. uh, hover over like me or Matt. Okay. And I hit can. more. All right. Yeah. There you go. Um, make host. All right. I did it. Okay. I'm the host now. Okay. That means an F I'm the captain now. And, and back to me, or do you want to try and hang on? Uh, okay. <laughs> what happens is that the when you talk, it moves the participants around. Mm. Your host now. Oh, t cracking. All right. Desktop one. See, see, Gene actually has spent time growing his beard. I shaved two days ago. Uh <laughs> so you did see uh, Gene create a new wallet for an existing kind of color. 
But what you can also do is create a new color. You see there's, there's two, two ways to make a colored coin wallet. And here you can see it shows us how much uh, cheer we have, which is what we, what we can afford to make the uh, value of the new color set be. So I'm going to put half of my cheer into a new coin, which uh, we will we'll see get generated. Uh, we do have to wait for this transaction to go through, so there's going to be a little bit of onion ring but you can see that we've generated a new wallet and it's expecting to get 50 cheer. And from here, we can give it a, a name. Uh, I'm going to call it uh, 50 coin because I'm creative. Um, and this has its own set of addresses. Uh, you can send it and it will show up in the trade manager the same as our other colored coins. Uh, this is a local name, by the way. This name will not be automatically sent to other people unless you communicate to it to them along with the actual cryptographic identifying information of the coin. So we do want to make that relatively easy to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so there we go. Hopefully that would that, that answered the question of where the colored coins are coming from. I just made the demo coin specifically early. Okay. Uh, let's, um, Bram, people are complaining that 20 transactions a second aren't enough. How are we going to fix that? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, so well, first off, this is nowhere near being a problem. It's only like a problem if you have really high persistent sustained transaction fees, which actually even Bitcoin doesn't have today. I think Bitcoin transaction fees are like pushing a dollar or something at the moment. Uh, <clears throat> and then still going down to zero overnight, I think. Um, the, if you want scaling, you should use payment channels. We actually are a much better platform for payment channels uh, than Bitcoin is. Although the minimum viable product for a payment channel network is a giant code base. So we're not uh, building one yet. That's a off in the future kind of project. Yeah, once mainnet's launched, there's gonna be kind of the next wave of core development we have to do and there's gonna be payment channels and some other things. Um, the other question was, uh, what about uh, confidential transactions? About what transactions? Confidential transactions. Uh, <clears throat> we're not supporting confidential transactions. That's a huge headache. <laughs> what would be a real world example of use case of creating a demo coin and trading for Chia? Um, if you were, say, the uh, government of uh, a, a sovereign nation and you wanted to issue a stable coin backed by your currency, it's a color coin is a very wet, easy way to do that. So you could have your um, I think of a fake country. How about a Federation Star Trek uh, coin? So Federation coin could be available and backed by the uh, treasury of, uh, of the Federation. You two could uh, foreclose on a starship. Um, and what they'd be able to do is issue uh, actual one for one in Fed coin and the uh, actual Federation currency. And so the idea would be that they can then delegate that and rate limit it. So like local banks could actually issue that. They will also be able to do things like uh, use our distributed identity wallet to have you only uh, selectively reveal that you have passed KYC or that you're actually a resident or all these different kind of things that you'll want to be able to do. And that color coin that they create would be able to continue to uh, be minted over time. That could be with the rules they set up. Um, it can only be minted by these certain uh, keys because those are the keys that are the treasury, if you will, for them. Um, and they can actually even set it up so that like an application that traded in FedCoin would pay fees in FedCoin. But what's going on behind the scenes is that offers are being posted and they're uh, making Chia to FedCoin uh, offer counters and closing those out on the blockchain so that your end user sees, I paid 2% fees to send a thousand dollar, a thousand FedCoins. Uh, but in fact, you know, it was like half a Chia in the back end. Um. Uh, one thing about uh, confidential transactions, we might in the distant future uh, support confidential transactions via an extension block, uh, but you know, the state of the technology is moving so fast over there. I don't want to bank on much of anything at the moment. Um, and they're much larger and blah, 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 blah. It, it, think of it as we'll probably get confidential transactions via an extension block after Bitcoin. Distributed identity, are you using DID? And the answer is yes. Um, we've got some neat additions to that uh, to make it very recoverable because that's one of the biggest issues with identity over the long haul. But uh, you'll be seeing that soon. Go ahead, Brad. 
Yeah, yeah, the sort of top of the list of smart transactions that we are going to implement but haven't yet is a distributed identity wallet. Uh, and there's a question of like, well, what functionality does that describe? Uh, so it's specifically, concretely, uh, what I'm talking about there is uh, ha having a wallet uh, which can say, which has an identity that's persistent over time. And it can say, if I lose access to my funds, here's a set of other um, distributed identity wallets that I give the ability to essentially jack my wallet to, to recover it for me. I trust that this sub this set of people won't uh, will only recover my wallet if I want them to. I trust them a little bit. Uh, so here, here they are as a group. Um, and uh, this functionality exists already. It's uh, that functionality exists already. It's sort of trivial using uh, a secret splitting. What this is going to do differently is make it so that this ability to do the recovery will persist across the recoverers for you doing recoveries themselves. So even if they've lost all their information and had to be recovered, that new recovered wallet can still participate in the recovery of your wallet. So Matt, what happens once the offer has been accepted? Can it be accepted multiple times? How are offers secured? Can I manipulate the amounts? I suppose the answer is no, but so once an offer has been accepted, then the, well, you can think of an offer as permission for someone to spend your money as long as they do what you want. Uh, so once that offer has been accepted, the money that the offer references is no longer there. So you can't have, uh, if someone else tries to accept it, 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 it the money won't be there um, because someone else will have taken it. Yeah, the, the, the coins specific got specific coin, right? Yeah, it's the coins got spent. Again. Yeah, the coins got spent. This is in the UTXO model. So when we say coin, uh, this means the thing that in Bitcoin land is called a UTXO. Um, <clears throat> the, the term unspent transaction output is actually slightly technically wrong in Chia, and also that's just a real mouthful. So we call them coins, uh, but the life cycle of a coin is it's created and then it dies and then it's gone forever. Uh, so when, a, uh, when an offer is accepted, essentially what happened was there were two coins, uh, one colored, one not, or, or two different colors, and they both got spent, both going to different targets. And then the other side of the offer actually did it the other way as well. So you have four coins here, possibly more, that all got spent, and, uh, and now they're gone. Uh, their, their value got transferred into new coins, uh, and you can't have a double spend of the old coins. It's just not a thing anymore. And you know, when you're taking an offer, one of the things we'll do is check to make sure that the coins are not spent yet, right? Um, do you have to use color coins? The answer is absolutely not. There's no reason you have to use color coins at all. It's just that we do expect interesting things to occur in color coins. So just like ERC-20 tokens did some things, our color coins can do a lot more than an ERC-20 token did. And so we think there are going to be some creative uh, outlets. Uh, I believe, Matt, you were talking about playing tic-tac-toe on color coins, right? Uh, yeah, I think that would be cool. That's something I'm working on in my spare time. Can you describe that a little bit? Uh, uh, what do you want describing about it? How you'd play tic-tac-toe with colored coins. Well, colored coins support uh, puzzles inside them. So they themselves are a puzzle, but they support, you know, more stuff going on. So we could do it so that uh, we have a cheerless program that enforces the rules of tic-tac-toe. And uh, that would be compatible with colored coins because colored coins are compatible with smart contracts. So uh, somebody asked about a scenario. I've been farming for some time and one of my farming garages just died. No backup, of course. What just happened to Chia? What just happened to me as a farmer? What should be my next step? Um, so for the network, if like you had a terabyte on that drive and it disappears, well, the net space is going to go down by a terabyte. Um, the nice part is that like you can go and completely replot those. So you're right. You don't need to back them up. You just, you know, get a new terabyte drive, throw it in and put your plots on um, and you regenerate them. Uh, any index, whatever, it doesn't really matter because this is all kind of uh, building a bingo card of possible right answers and a different beginning uh, root of that bingo card just means you got a different likelihood. There's no ch differences between those likelihoods. Um, as a farmer, any of your farming rewards went to your wallet. And so your wallet key is separate from all this. You don't want your keys to be lost. So you're going to care very much about your keys, YAML, 
and the secret key and the, the plot keys themselves. Each new plot you make has a new plot key for it. So you don't have to worry about that. You'll have a new plot key when those new plots come around. So, you know, the nice thing there is that like plots are easily destroyable and recreatable. Um, you know, you don't have to kind of worry about that. It's just that you want to make sure they're up and farming to be able to have a, a chance of winning the next plot. Bram, uh, this new coin model sounds closer to Mimiwimble format, where old spent transaction outputs get pruned over time, right? Uh, yeah, as soon as something is spent, it's just gone. Uh, in a bunch of privacy coins, there's this always growing set of, uh, I forget what they call them, but basically you don't know which coins have been spent already, so you, every coin that's ever been created, you still need to keep track of until the end of time. Uh, in the UTXO model, uh, because you're not trying to enforce those privacy uh, features, uh, as soon as something's spent, you can forget about it. Uh, in practice, this lowers the uh, th this lowers the um, the load on uh, full nodes uh, because they have to keep track of less stuff in memory. Question, will Chia uh, network underwrite independent security code audit, and if so, before or after main mail? Um, we absolutely will be doing independent security audits. The first one that's going to be most important is for BLS. Um, we may not be the only one doing that. Uh, that's going to be seen exactly, but the point is, is that BLS has to be right. Um, exact timing is not as clear. BLS will likely be done before mainnet. Um, the rest of the protocol, you know, there are pieces that we kind of have good security level knowledge of, but then also we're going to need to do some audits. So, you know, that's kind of what we expect, kind of Q3, Q4. Don't know if all those audits will be complete, but we want to be very, very confident in the um, consensus algorithm because we do not want to do a whole. Yeah, the, the, um, the BLS uh, format that we're using is the one coming out of the IETF. There's the standard standards process uh, that we've been participating in from the beginning that's taking a bunch of different BLS libraries that a bunch of people wrote and mashing together all the best ideas from them and coming up with an actual standard, which is supposed to be exactly what everybody uses. We'll, we'll see if that actually happens, <laughs> but we are trying our best uh, to, uh, to be good citizens and, uh, and participate in that. And that does have the benefit that everyone's uh, implementations get kind of audited together if you're all using the same implementation. It also means cross-chain uh, you know, transactions are very feasible in those kinds of things as well. Um, there's a kind of long question about you know, how energy is. I, I just want to say one thing. And it's worth noting that uh, all our implementations are publicly available on GitHub. And so if you, if you want to peer review it, you're welcome to peer review it um, as well. Yeah, it's worth a note too that our GitHub is structured. The Chia blockchain is kind of the master uh, repo, but it pulls in uh, Chia Paws, which is Chia Proof of Space, Chia VDF, which is obviously proofs of time and time warding, uh, and then Chia BIP 158, uh, which is Neutrino, which is kind of funny. Uh, and uh, what's the fourth one, Bill? Uh, what, Paws, VDF, uh, uh, BIP 158, and BLS. BLS, right, of course, BLS pulls in. So the BLS library is, comes from there. We've got a current working BLS library that's close to the IETF standard. But this is partially why we have to break plots, is that the new BLS library will not necessarily be compatible with the existing BLS library, and your plots have been signed with the existing BLS library. Um, the question I wanted to kind of address, uh, not in depth, but in, at a high level, is kind of this idea that, you know, uh, how much energy has to go to verification. Uh, there will always be energy costs to this. It's not going to be free. In other words, we are not taking the electrical use of validation to zero. Um, we are, however, taking it way far down and making it not scale as badly. So for the same kind of unit of electricity spent, you're going to get a lot more security with the geoblockchain is the way to kind of think about it. Uh, will Chia be acting as a central bank with its pre-farm? How much of the total supply would the pre-farm be? The second question we'll be getting a lot more transparent about as we get closer to mainnet. Uh, but a significant pre-farm, that pre-farm though is held by the company. Uh, we plan to have an independent uh, majority outside board and start reporting like a public company. So you'll see the entire kind of uh, gap audited financials and you know all the statements we're gonna be making from a corporate governance perspective about how we use the pre-farm. Um, I don't really like to use the word central bank, but we are going to be a source of liquidity to Chia. 
Um, if a CFO at a tech company wants to start paying their national invoices in Chia, they can borrow Chia from us for operations and pay us interest in Chia back. And that's one of our major revenue streams. We also expect to loan a lot of Chia to uh, various market makers to be able to have stable markets on the various uh, coin market exchanges. Okay, we've gone to almost two hours. I think it actually has been fun to do it long. I was hoping to do it shorter, but that's okay. Uh, is there anything else we need to show, gentlemen, before we have, move on? Have, have our transactions hit the blockchain yet? Yeah, I think yeah. you should have the offer accepted have gone through now. Let's go back and see you that. You have your one demo coin. Yep. Let's go look at our wallet. I now have one demo coin. You want to show that share screen? Am it's I not sharing? live demo. I thought I was sharing. I am sharing, aren't I? Oh, oh, no. You're not sharing those. Aha. Uh -huh. Successful live demo in Windows running on a Mac. So uh, if you were just looking at the front page of the wallet and I got one demo coin here in my colored coin wallet, I'll click on that and you'll see you're 10 Chia poor. I am 10 Chia poor. I only have three Chia left in this. We, we can't see, man. Let's what? see. Well, there's stuff in the way to. Uh, yeah. There was stuff in the way of me. Oh, there we go. Uh, could we see the colored coin value having gone through? Is this all? Yeah. So I now have one demo coin. Yeah. And oh, I, see. I would only have three Chia of my 13 left. Okay, cool. Obviously, Matt's wallet has the uh, ten Chia in it now, and and that offer is now invalid now for people that want to take it. Yeah, if you try to take it, it would just fail. Timeline for mainnet, as we mentioned earlier in the uh, Zoom, is uh, end of year. Uh, could be as early as well November ish, and it could be as late as January. But I think that's the window that people should have in mind. Um, we may not want to launch in December just for obvious reasons. Will we be doing other Zoom sessions in the future? The answer is absolutely. Uh, we're going to be slowly but surely adding all of the reference transactions to the blockchain over the coming weeks. And we'll be adding the distributed identity wallet later. And each one of those is probably worth kind of walking through and letting people play with and see. Um, and as we have major milestones about uh, usability or installability, those are going to be other times we'll do these kind of uh, uh, Zooms. Um, I said I do this on the weekends because I think a lot of people will want to play with Chia on their nights and weekends. Um, we could certainly think about doing some nights as well. Uh, and if you guys have any uh, thoughts about times that make sense, please feel free to mention them in uh, uh, Keybase General or Keybase Testnet. Uh, if you've got additional technical questions, it kind of uh, breaks up this way in Keybase. Um, if you're asking about the overall project or just kind of general concepts, that's uh, general. If you're talking about actually running things day to day, uh, the Chia blockchain and the wallet and farming, that goes in testnet. And if you've got developer questions about you know, how to make new colored coins or make new Chia list contracts or how we're implementing BLS or those kinds of things, that goes in the dev channel. Are there any other questions before we kind of wrap up? Uh, I'll be posting this on YouTube shortly after this. It may take uh, an hour or two to get uh, uploaded and correctly compressed. Hopefully on um, the next one, we'll actually be able to live stream this on YouTube at the same time. Uh, and that way it'll be uh, immediately available on YouTube thereafter. Uh, also, uh, Matt is going to be uh, publishing uh, a kind of uh, average user's guide to color coins. It will walk you through what we did today, but in a much more compact, uh, compact and concise, approximately 10 minutes. And then uh, later in the week, I believe, or maybe the week after, we'll be able to publish a uh, kind of developer guide to colored coins demo uh, that'll get you a better sense of how to build color uh, and all those sorts of things. Okay. It, it, we're going to be coming out with stable releases regularly, probably about once per week. Uh, and then once in a while, a hard fork release. We know there's going to be at least two of those coming up before mainnet. Uh, mainnet is never going to have a hard fork, but testnet uh, we're still having to do hard forks on while we're getting all the primitives final. Nice. I just wanted to add um, thanks to the community for helping us with uh, testnet. All the farmers, 
everybody testing has really been really been great. Yep. Also, thanks for uh, the community helping the community. It's been great seeing you guys be able to help each other as we get going forward. Um, and you know, we generally have somebody lurking twenty four seven because we have other developers in Asia and developers in Europe. It's late night in London for Matt, uh, so he'll be going uh, probably out to party shortly hereafter. Uh, but you know, we always have somebody awake generally on Keybase. And, and sorry about the hard forks, everyone. <laughs> Try to not do too many of them. <laughs> yeah, and one of the things we did is this had a hard fork in as we pulled one of the hard fork items into this as well. So we actually got some of the hard fork stuff out of the way, but we do have plots and one other item that we know are gonna have to hard fork, so. Okay, looks like testnet's quiet. Looks like uh, there's no open questions. Is there anything in chat? Uh, Brian uh, someone in chat says, how important is Cheerlisp? If you're just concerned with the money, you don't need to touch it at all. It, you can just use the UI and, and, and send using stock transaction types. If you're interested in developing uh, smart transactions and smart contracts, then those are governed by Cheerlisp. The think, expectation is very few people will actually code in Cheerlisp. Most people will use wallets that use uh, that have their own code that's not running on the blockchain and they interact code written in Chia Lisp that is running on the blockchain. But a lot of this is hidden from people. Uh, Chia Lisp is a much, much nicer environment for actually implementing smart transactions than uh, Solidity or really anything you could build on top of the EVM is. Um, but it's uh, a little unorthodox. It's uh, the uh, usually development environments are designed to be easy to hack stuff together and then often this results in them being extremely difficult to audit. Uh, Chialisp is designed to be as easy as it possibly can be to audit, so it front loads a lot of that pain. <laughs> uh, so it's a little unusual how you code in it. We've made it a lot easier due to our own dog food eating uh, over time and will be made uh, more easy uh, in the future, but there's some uh, learning curve there. Uh, but the advantage is that it is a totally appropriate thing for handling real money. It's not a web scripting language. And, and you're welcome to try it out. It's up there. So yeah, go for it. Uh, as someone did, uh, post in testnet with your wallet address. And those of us who have a bunch of testnet here will send you to you. Um, and uh, people are asking where are the install instructions. If you go to chia.net, there's a big button that says install should be pretty easy to get. Um, um, you can also find our Keybase uh, channels there. It uh, is actually quite useful. Uh, yeah, someone asked what was the point of just trading 10 Chia for one Chia in the demo we just showed. The UX here isn't the greatest. That probably shouldn't be labeled Chia because uh, the melt value of colored coins is pretty irrelevant. So it should probably be actually labeled as being demo coins instead of Chia. Um, there's melt value to Chia. That's usually going to be extremely small. Uh, that So it might be that like one mojo represents like one cent, which would mean that one Chia would be like $10 billion or something if you have like a, a stable coin, right? That, that, you, uh, <clears throat> that, that you issued uh, as a colored thing. And you can't forge things having the color. Uh, that, that's enforced by the underlying protocol. Uh, so so it, it didn't trade... It, it traded 10 Chia, 10 like free to do whatever you want with Chia for one melt value Chia worth of colored coin, but the real value of colored coins is the, the whatever's backing them, whatever they're viewed as being uh, as an actual backed coin. And usually their melt value is going to be extremely small. Yeah, I mean, one way to think about it is as Tether works on both Omni and ERC20, you know, Tether could work very well inside of a Chia colored coin. Yeah, but we probably should improve this UX to <laughs> not emphasize the melt value because <laughs> that's very confusing. <laughs> Great. Okay, folks, uh, you know, your questions and answers uh, on the key base. Uh, the other thing to do is look at the repo wiki. It's got install instructions, the quick start guide, and uh, has an FAQ both uh, locally in the wiki for the repo, kind of more detailed, and then there's the overall project FAQ on the main site there too. Thanks very much, and we'll be posting this shortly. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks.